Will everyone please find their seat? Those who are waiting in the lobby, please come in and have a seat. Would you remove your reserve signs from the back of your chairs, please? Thank you. Uh, all of the housekeeping I have to do, I love doing the housekeeping. Please turn your cells, phones off. Silence them, as, as is the proper words. Well. Just waiting a few minutes till everyone comes in. Where's my Sherry? Sherry Margolis Saslo, where are you, my darling? You usually, usually be when at Oscar time, they're in the restroom. <laughs> so we'll wait for Sherry Margolis Saslow, who will not like to walk down the center aisle while everybody applauds her. <laughs> but maybe that's the Beshert, as they say in, in Japanese. <laughs> Thank you for laughing. My mother thanks you for laughing. Everybody thanks you for laughing, because the staff doesn't laugh at me anymore. Oi, Carol, not again. Hi, sweetheart. Nice to see you all. So, so ladies, where's mother? She's in the restroom. And we're going to wait for her, because as Big Al said to me, just let it flow. No pun intended, Big Al. Just let it flow. So I want to tell you, I'm not sorry. L'chaim. L'chaim, absolutely. Um, so I'll do a little editorializing before uh, we begin this uh, beautiful, beautiful community support. Um, I wasn't going to do this, but again, Bashir, for 35 years I've taken care of older adults. I've worked with f four executive directors, maybe six. I worked at this time in, with Rochelle Upfall who has been so wonderful for the Jewish senior life, two campuses, 
one in West Bloomfield, the Applebaum campus, Eugene and Marcia, and one at 10 Mile in Greenfield, caring uh, the Taubman campus, Alfred Taubman, caring for over 900 older adults in our bricks and mortar, 2,800 older adults in the community. This is my speech 107, where's your mother? <laughs> we have a, how am I doing? Am I gonna get a job on television? I've been waiting for a job on television. Sherry, my Sherry! How long does it take you to go to the restroom? You, you need to get more beautiful, you know? Welcome, everyone. I, I just want to say that my name is Carol Rosenberg. I am the director of the Jewish Senior Life Foundation. And these are my words of communication to you. Communication. The communication that we use in our world today is through a variety of mediums. There are musics, arts, film. What else? Computers, television, radio, and books. And I don't even have to tell you about books when you have a aging services for the Holocaust survivors and their families. Books are so precious to each and every one of you. How many of you have books on your shelf in your home? Come on, don't be shy. You tell the truth. How many of you have had Jeffrey's books? on your shelf. Amen to that. And through, through all of these ways, we communicate. And where's Arthur Horowitz? Arthur, you're a hell of a communicator. And where's Carly Schwartz? Carla Schwartz, where are you? Where are you, you sweet, beautiful thing? Where are you? Carla? She, she was here. She must have escaped me. <laughs> Murray Feldman is supposed to be here. but. He's here. Where's Murray? In the bathroom. <laughs> Touche. Yeah, there he is. Murray. You're handsome and a good communicator. Absolutely. And, and, and in our world, there's a guy by the name of Mark Schlussel. And he's a great, where are you, Mark? Great communicator. Love hearing you, Mark. And so we're, we're going to, meet tonight to, and we are meeting tonight, to, to celebrate one hell of an outstanding communicator, probably the quintessence of communication by, by, by example of all of you people who really, really are here for really, uh, we don't thank you. you. You're here because you want to be here. You're here because this is, was such a beautiful, beautiful idea, and you'll hear how it unfolded as we begin this evening. And the power of, of Jeff's legacy is so incredible, so Jewish seed of life because of our friendship with Jeff and because of our friendship and deep admiration for Sherry, said we have to have the Jeff Saslow annual media night and yearly we will honor another celebrity communicator in our community. Tonight, this one's for you, all of the families that knew Jeffrey all of the friends that love Jeffrey, this one's for you. And so I introduce Leslie Katz, director of Friends. It's a little song. Good evening, I'm Leslie Katz, the director of Friends. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I'd like to introduce and recognize the leader of our organization, Rochelle Upfall, CEO of JSL. Rochelle, please. Thank you. I'd like to thank Rochelle and Carol Rosenberg, who's the director of the JSL Foundation, for being such strong advocates for friends. Working with professionals as inspiring and as dedicated as Rochelle and Carol are is a true joy. Additionally, I extend my sincere gratitude to Beth Tryon and Renee Fine for all they've done to help make this evening a success. Thank you both. Um, 
please join me in congratulating our amazing co-chairs, Karen Kraft and Julie Ritten. I know you'll be inspired by this significant program. When you leave, please take note of our information about Jewish senior life and friends on the table in the foyer. My contact information is on your literature if you have any questions. Thank you. Now I welcome Karen Kraft and Julie Ritten. Karen Kraft, co-chair of this fabulous remembrance of Jeffrey Zaslow. We are here tonight to honor and celebrate the life and literary works of Jeff. A labor of love does not even describe the dedication of our committee. I'd like to thank the committee individually for all their hard work. Elaine Bearish, Kalina Botson, Jill Margolick, Jerry Margolis, Hannah Moss, Alan Muscovitz, Joanne Robinson, Rosie Schlessel, Lynn Silverman, Linda Solomon, Larry Slutsky, and Michael Stone. We hope you will leave this evening inspired by the magic that was Jeffrey Zaslow. Carol's going to kill me. I am just blown away by this crowd, and this is what a tribute. And what an honor for us to have Adam, for the Zaslows to allow us to do this event. I thank you, thank you, thank you, a hundred times over. You and Jeff have always been gracious supporters of JSL, and there was no way that we were not going to do this. And it's because of you, you have been there for us for eight over 80, for Walk of Ages, for media nights. The list goes on and on, and you know it, and we know it. And you never said no, and we are there for you now. For Sherry, for Jordan, for Alex, for Eden, we love you and thank you again for allowing us to do this. So, uh, Julie, you, you went off script. That was pretty, very clever. We're, we're going to make you chairman next year. <laughs> uh, wh when we decided to, to, to do something like this, you know, I, I could stand up here, ugh, Carol again. So you had to look for some really cool guys. Now, who do you think those two guys could possibly be? Well, let me just tell you. I have to read his bio. Why? He needs a job. His name is Alan Muscovitz. Big Al! <laughs> to the listeners of the Dick Curtin Show in Detroit, Alan Muscovitz was known as Big Al Muscovito, working for the legendary National Broadcasting Hall of Famer for 18 years. Today, Al is a regular guest host on the Mitch Album Show on WJR. Is that what you're doing now when I call you? <laughs> when not on the air, he's a columnist for the Detroit Jewish News. You like him, Arthur? and can also be seen and heard as a dinner speaker, MC, commercial actor, and voiceover tele talent for television and radio. He will give you his resume after this evening's <laughs> program. Now, where's that Mike Stoney Stone? Isn't he cute? Isn't he cute? He's very cute. And he has twins. Now, I'm so jealous of anybody who has twins, so mazel tov to the wives who have twins. That's all I can tell you. How old are they now, the twins? 14. Isn't that nice? Well, Mike Stoney Stone is the co-host of the highly rated Stoney and Bill morning radio show on 97.1 FM, The Ticket. He's been a fix fixture in Detroit radio <laughs> for parts of the last four decades before joining The Ticket. <laughs> Mike, you can hire me. I'll do that on the air. Mike was the co-host of the popular Stoney and the Wojo show on WDFN from 1994 to 2009. He has been a part of WXYZ TV Sunday Sports Update since 1997, and I watch you in bed with a cookie and milk every time you're on. Don't I, David? I love him, don't I? Okay, so if you think you've had a few laughs, 
Watch these guys perform. Take it away, Big Al and Stoney. <laughs> How does it feel to be employed, Mike? Oh, it's wonderful. How does it feel not to get up at 4.30 every freaking morning? Better than you think. I'm... I just have a quick follow-up question from Carol. Yes. How many people don't have Jeff's books? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. So uh, Mike and I really span two generations, really, of, of knowing Jeff. And uh, yours starts out a, a lot sooner than mine. I, I was a later in life Jeff fan. Yes, you were. Yes. And uh, I was a Jeff fan for a, a real long time. Uh, there's a town in um, suburban Philadelphia called Broomall, Pennsylvania. Yeah! yeah. Where uh, back then in the, uh, the 60s, I, mean, I, I forget when exactly Zaz moved into where the, uh, on Dartmouth Lane. My parents bought the house in 1961. I think it was for $21,000 then. And then when they sold it, it was a lot, hell of a lot more. But it was a town that uh, was about maybe 10% Jewish, all white. We, it, was, it, was, it was America. It was, it was suburbia. And you know, we lived, I lived on Cornell Circle. Zazas lived on, on Dartmouth Lane, which was about a half mile up the, up the street off of New Ardmore Avenue. And it was just a, a simpler time. Um, I wouldn't say that we were best friends, but we were good friends. We were in the same kindergarten carpool. We, <laughs> we were in a, we tried to form a band back probably in, I don't know, fourth grade. We called ourselves the Living Dead. <laughs> it was Jeff, myself, a guy named Jeff Dorman, Steve Polinsky, and Steve Glossman, and we had such great hits as uh, When Will They Ever Learn? with lyrics like, when will the smoking stop <laughs> and the robberies? Yes, as you can tell, nothing happened. Um, Zaz was one of the only people I knew who had worse handwriting than I did. If you've ever had any kind of note or anything written by Zaz, and I can have the proof right here, their high school yearbook, that if you want to see afterwards, he could not write at all, at least as far as you know, cursive, yes, exactly, or printing. Um, I remember the days we would play street hockey in the cul-de-sac right around Dartmouth Lane where they grew up with the Snydermans and we'd put the nets up there and sometimes Lisa would come out and actually play with us. I do remember those days. Uh, one thing about Zaz that always kind of bothered me because I was the real sports freak. He wasn't. He had like real interests, not just sports. <laughs> if my memory is correct and it could be wrong, he was the only person I knew that had his bar mitzvah on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and in 1971... You're talking about that day? That day. Yeah. In 1971, Oklahoma played Nebraska. And considering, all right, now hold. Oklahoma played oh. Nebraska in one of the biggest college football games of all time. We couldn't watch it because it was a Zaz's bar mitzvah. Now, a few weeks later, <laughs> a few weeks later was my bar mitzvah. What was the theme? I got to know. We didn't have freaking <laughs> themes back then. <laughs> And they didn't cost what they cost now. <laughs> anyway, so, and at Zaz's bar mitzvah, he wore like a pink suit. <laughs> this is my bar mitzvah. Here's Zaz right here. Mm -hmm. And here's me. Aww. So as you can see, they, they, they come back. No, uh, those weren't my glasses. That was uh, Dean Sandler. I probably remember every single guy up there. Anyway. Um, we were different in other ways, too. I was a camp person. Zaz was a shore person. Every summer he went down the shore and would come back with stories of him, paper routes at the Atlantic City Press and all the kind of great stuff he did. Um, but it was his writing, even at a young age. I mean, Al, he, he would write for his school paper, uh, the Mar News, which I have one copy right <laughs> here. This is just the one. Uh, next year, I'll be... Oh, in 20 years, this is in 1976, uh, I'll be 37, married and pregnant with a fourth child. He was close. Yeah. <laughs> the years were off. He had three, so he pretty much knew what he was going to do. Um, we, let's see. How else were we different? Both of our fathers <laughs> were in the real estate business, and they actually went at each other uh, on a supermarket that was going to be built with a blue, with a, a highway in the back of his house. <laughs> My father's company built the supermarket 
Harry Zaslow was opposed to it, and we actually had a debate in junior high school about it that was kind of in interesting. <laughs> um, Zaz's mom, Naomi, worked for the school district. She did everything. She uh, did all, she was like the PR director of the schools. My mom shopped and bitched at everybody. That was the school <laughs> As my wife can attest. Um, in student council, Zaz was the president. I was the vice president. I campaigned on a fake promise of bringing Bruce Springsteen to our high school. Now, it wasn't that outrageous back in 1975 because he wasn't that huge. We had to settle. I was away at summer camp. Zaz, I came back and he said, Stoney, I couldn't do this. We got Livingston Taylor, James Taylor's brother. That wasn't bad. Yeah, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, Jeff was always smart. And if you know anything about sports, it seems like the people who participate, and I know this from my own experience with my own daughters, Zaz did cross country, long distance running. And, it's, and my, my daughter does this now. And it, uh, for some strange reason, it always seems, and I know it's a stereotype, the brightest kids are always into cross country and, and those type of things because they have the discipline, uh, they have the leadership qualities to do things by themselves. It, it, it's amazing. Um, after, after American, uh, but before American, after I graduated high school, he went to a real college, Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon. I went to American University, which back then, although Daryl went to American before I did, so you know it was a party school back in the 70s. Now it's a real school. <laughs> um, somehow, we ended up in Detroit. And I'll never forget when I moved here to work at Channel 4, somebody said, you know, Zaz has this girlfriend. She's, you know, on, she's an anchor person at Channel 2. Why don't you meet? And he was still living in Chicago. And we hooked up all the time. And uh, he, was, he was the greatest, um, as, as everybody knows. Uh, another coincidence was we have the same next-door neighbors. The Shiners live next door to them. They moved. Where they moved? Next to us. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Um, but the, be the best thing about Jeff, Jeff was he always cared about everybody else more than himself. And I always, every once in a while, I always say to myself, well, why couldn't I be that? And you know, sometimes I, I'm so focused on myself. The kindness, the way he just loved people. He never, he never wanted favors. Here was a guy who made a lot of money, probably could have made a lot more if he really wanted to. He was on The Tonight Show. He did all this stuff. He never wanted favors from people. I know for, like, for Springsteen tickets and things like that. Let's go. Let's do this. I said, well, you can call somebody and get tickets. No, I, I don't want to do it. He, he was egoless. And let me tell you, in this business, as you know, and in the, <laughs> no, working with a lot of people, there are a lot of ego assholes in our business. <laughs> Zaz is just, was the opposite of that. He cared about you. He didn't care about himself. And that was like the best thing. And whenever we'd see him, and, you know, always, you know, you regret stuff that we didn't spend as much time together even here as we should have. But we'd go out for lunch. And he would always ask about the show. I listened to do this, all that. And I'd ask about him. He didn't want to talk about himself. Always asked about Cindy and the girls. That's all he cared about. And I wish I could have been as selfless as him. And I knew it from the very, you always knew from the very beginning that he was going to be a success. Out of any, we had 638 people in our high school class. And you knew who was going to be number one in those things. And you knew that from the, from the get-go. Beautiful. Wow. <laughs> I, it's the first time I've ever heard any of that, and it's, it's fantastic. Had I known, we would have found a kid that was a lot more like Jeff that could have spoken about it. <laughs> but since you were... <clears throat> <laughs> but we didn't have time to vet. The vetting process was uh, <laughs> difficult. And I am not egoless, and I'm not an asshole. <laughs> right? Right, honey? <clears throat> I only was in the radio business for 18 years. Maybe if I had lasted 10 more years, I am completely <laughs> convinced I would have been an asshole. <laughs> uh, let me tell you that, uh, like I said, we have two generations of, of really having Jeff Zaslow enter our lives. And that, that was just precious and a real treasure, Mike, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I, uh, we came along later in life, my wife and I, because we met Jeff and Sherry uh, because we sold them. The first time I ever met her was when we sold her and Jeff, our condominium. My wife and I lived in a condominium, and we were, uh, we had uh, one baby at the time, and a very, we were selling our condo, 
uh, by owner. And uh, this very pregnant woman showed up at my doorstep that looked very familiar with uh, Jordan about right here. <laughs> And our goal was, and we became instant friends, but despite our great friendship, our, our goal, to be very transparent, was to se sign the papers before the air conditioning broke again. <laughs> <laughs> but we did leave them, I think we didn't charge you for the shelves that are there, they're free. They were free because we couldn't get them off the walls and we didn't charge you. And the humidifier. <clears throat> and we fixed the door wall. No, uh, that really changed, that selling that condominium changed my life on so many levels. First of all, we ended up with two beautiful friends. Um, and actually it ended up changing my life because Sherry, we went up north together as couples and she said, you should be on the Dick Purton Show. I said, oh yeah, right. Fast forward, she makes a call, started working for Dick part-time after doing an audition and it changed my life and went on to a full-time career, which Sherry warned me would one day come back to haunt me. <laughs> and she was right, no. <laughs> No, it all worked out well. Uh, one of the fondest memories I have of what Jeff, and Jeff always, he was rapid fire, rapid fire. He'd always call me up and go, Alan Muscovitz. And it would be like that, and I knew exactly who was on the phone. Everybody, Alan Muscovitz. I go, is that right, girls? Yeah. Eden Sasso. So <clears throat> he would call me, and he, little did he know at the time he requested this, and this is the, completely the truth, is that I had been suffering from just awful anxiety attacks. I went through a phase where I couldn't figure it out why I was having anxiety attacks. And that was about the time Jeff asked me if I'd like to go in front of 6,000 people in Navy Pier in a Seinfeld look-alike contest. You don't look like Jerry. No, I don't. I came in second in the George portion, right? Came in second. Here I am already anxious and I come all the way that way, 6,000 people, Navy Pier. And I came in second. But thanks to their support and, and, and Xanax, um, <laughs> it all worked out right. But it was Jeff's uh, inquisitiveness. And I mean, he would always question me and, and ask me what I'm doing, think bigger. And you know, look, we, we've lost <clears throat> folks in our lives who have had an impact on our life. And I, I'm not saying it because I'm standing here in front of his beautiful family. But I, I really can't recall on, on so many different levels the impact this man continues to have on me today. Uh, I just, everything I think of creatively, I always think, what would Jeff think? Because he had raised the bar so high. Uh, and as much as he wrote these prolific books and incredible, incredible advice that he gave over the years, and everything that you described, Stoney, about selfless and never asking for anything in return, that's exact, I don't have to repeat it, though it bears repeating. He uh, always thought about, you know, what could he do for you? But his best, I think that Sherry told me this, and, and it makes total sense if you know Jeff, that the award that meant the most to him was uh, the, I even a typed in here C attached, because <laughs> I didn't want to screw this up because it is so important, but the most meaningful thing that Jeff received, and he received awards for his writing for years, but he received the Will Rogers Humanitarian Award. And that, yes. And I looked it up on the website, Turns out you can buy it yourself. It really wasn't that, no, 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 no. It was for uh, a column and, uh, that he was, uh, wrote and helped 47,000 disadvantaged children, 47,000. For 12 years, he hosted an annual singles party for charity, Zazbash, which drew 7,000 readers a year and resulted in 78 marriages. But I know and Sherry will tell you that the Will Rogers Humanitarian Award meant the most to him. This is a man that has New York Best Time sellers all over, all over the list of, of best sellers. Whatever it was, this is what was so meaningful to him. So awards aside, that, I mean, describes Jeff to a T. Uh, you know, so many people these days live 100 years, over 100 years. In 53 years, the man lived a lifetime of good. And that's what I you know sustains you guys. I know it's what sustains me when I think about him because I shake my head every time I do think about him. And one thing I, I thought of too was that you know he wrote the books about Sully and Gabby and Randy, and they uh, Jeff didn't go to them and say, "Hey, I got an idea for a book about your life story." These impactful, incredible, world famous people who have had made major impacts on people came to him and said, you're the guy that's got to write this book. 
I mean, that to me says it all. So I always say, who writes the book about Jeff? Well, it's all here tonight, because this book just is an endless book. The chapters will keep going on and on and on, because we wanted this night so those feelings would continue and his legacy would continue, because, uh, you know, the wristbands, what would Jesus, I changed it to what would Jeff do? <laughs> Except we ran out of colors. All the <laughs> colors are gone on the wristbands. So that's, that's how I feel tonight. Um, I am so blessed to have had him in my life. The girls and Sherry, everybody's so proud of, of how they continue the legacy. And that's why we're here tonight. And next year it'll be held in June in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> um, my turn now to recognize a, a couple folks in the audience. Obviously Sherry and Jordan and Alex and Eden are here. Uh, and we're so blessed to have them all together tonight. Uh, there is family members that have come from near and far out of time, out of time. <laughs> I'm out of time. <laughs> and uh, I think that was in my headset, I'm out, no. Uh, but we thank everybody coming from the East Coast. We thank uh, Adam Grant's family who is here. He's such a good boy, he wrote a best-selling book himself you're gonna hear about. And uh, also, but very special, joining us, and perhaps the most meaningful book per in, in, in that I think a lot of folks would agree was the last book, the the Magic Room, the um, the Magic Room, because Jeff wrote it with his girls in his heart and in his mind. And tonight, uh, we we are so happy uh, that she had traveled to be here. I want to introduce you and just recognize her by having her stand up along with her daughter from the. Uh, uh, Becker's bridal, Shelly Becker and Alyssa Pung, her daughter. Where are you guys? What? Corey. Corey? Yes, I'm going to, yeah. We, and, and joined by her, thank you, Lisa, her husband, Corey, and also joined by a baby that is due in the coming months. So, mazel tov to you for that. And we know the magic will continue for you and your family. So, we are really so happy to have you here tonight. So uh, nobody, maybe except this man, and I think you even said to me before we came up here that I know uh, that Jeff was the, I thought, the biggest Bruce Springsteen fan ever, but you set the record straight. You were way ahead. Yeah, I mean, you said. Not way ahead. But, but pretty far. Yeah, we were both kind of obsessed with something really stupid. Right. <laughs> and it worked out. Yes. Um, <laughs> it worked out. Well, we're about to see a, a video in just a moment uh, that we put together that will feature some of one of Bruce's songs and also a very special guest appearance by a certain Zazlo daughter, Jordan, in it. And I want you to be aware of that when you're listening to it. And uh, I want to take a special thanks to uh, Adam Luger, who's 26 and knows how to use Final Cut Pro on a Mac computer. <laughs> <coughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't have been, I would still be working on it. So to Adam Luger, who did an outstanding job. So uh, with that, I'm going to actually do a little brief live introduction to the video. And I did fail to mention, I'm sorry, not only our uh, Adam Grant's parents here, but his grandparents as well. So thank you for being here. <laughs> Oy, would I have had big trouble. So uh, if our video folks are ready, I think we can begin. Tonight is a great night. Tonight is a night of reflection inspiration, and celebration. Tonight is not about looking back or regret, but about living in the now. Tonight is about making a difference in your life and the lives around you. It's what Jeff would want us to do. That's Jeff's legacy, a legacy of love that we honor tonight. And I think we're missing the sound. <laughs> We're going to have to start over. I'm sorry. Comic relief. Guys, do you have the sound? Like a vision, she dances across the porch as the radio plays. Roy Orbison sang for the lonely. Hey, that's me, and I want you only. Don't turn me home again. I just can't face myself alone again. Don't run back inside, darling. You what I'm here for So you're scared And you're thinking that Maybe we ain't that young Anymore Sure a little faith is magic In the night You ain't a beauty but hey, you're alright Oh yeah, and that's alright But 
My mother said, what in the world are you going to do with a creative writing degree? That's what she said to me. What are you going to do with that? And I said there, I said, well, I'm going to write, I'm going to be creative, I'm going to get a job, but I didn't really, didn't really know. And then I went and lived in her basement for 30 years. No, I didn't do that. But it all worked out really well. It's going to work out well. Some of you might be wondering, what are you going to do with your lives? It's all going to work out well. You're the smartest and the best, and it's going to work out, it's going to work out great. I feel like my, my experience as an advice columnist was helpful as I went about writing, uh, writing that book with Randy. I once got a letter from a guy who said, uh, it's Passover. He's feeling very constipated eating all that matzah. Do I have any advice? These are the questions I would get. So I thought a good product would be fiber matzah. And the slogan could be, let my people go. <laughs> Either that or you could take Exodus Lax or Matzah Musil too, you know. People ask me, they say, what do, you, what do your books have in common? And I think they're all about love, a love of uh, a family, a love of friends, a love of a sense of duty, and a love of life. And so uh, have a good rest of the day. And when you get home tonight, hug the people you care about. I'll, I'll be in the lobby and I'll sign your book if you'd like. But thank you for waking up this morning and seeing me. Thank you very much. I realized from being in that store, my job as a father is not to tell my daughters what dress to wear, not to tell them what to do. My job is to tell my girls I love them. And yeah. Sherry, that I love her too, obviously. Yeah. Uh, Alex, I could watch that clip every single time. I am going to make that a, like, screensaver on my computer. There's a lot of favorite parts in there, but I don't know. It's tough to top that one. It is tough to top the look on your face. Well, uh, we have a uh, very special guest tonight. Uh, we could not have really chosen a better person uh, to join us tonight as our inaugural guest speaker for the first annual Jeffrey Zaslow Media Night. And I think it's safe to say that Adam Grant would not have it any other way. I'm quoting Adam when he said, to millions of beloved readers, Jeff Zaslow was the wise, witty advice columnist who replaced Ann Landers and the best-selling author who inspired us to pursue and savor the most meaningful moments in life. But to me and countless other writers, Adam says, Jeff was a devoted mentor who gave countless hours of his time and energy to help aspiring writers and authors. My book is dedicated to his legacy, and I could not have written it without him. Mike? Well, it doesn't have the title screen. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It would actually require a separate event to actually tell you about Adam's topic, which is what we'll give you the reader's digest for. If you're born and raised here in the Detroit area, Adam achieved 
PhD and master's degree from the University of Michigan in organized psychology and his BA from Harvard, magna cum laude, with highest honors, Phi Beta Kappa honors, <laughs> and the John Harvard Scholarship for highest academic achievement. I can relate, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when he wasn't studying in school, and it's hard to believe that ever happened, uh, Adam did find time to become an All-American and Junior Olympic springboard diver. Based on all this, and I can't speak for Al, but it's abundantly clear that Adam and I have absolutely nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, I think it's safe to say 100% I'm with you. And uh, <laughs> Although you're probably good on the cannonball. I did it here at Tamashan. I was oh. a little kid right <laughs> after having... Uh, I did. You're right. Absolutely. And I'm proud of it, Mike. Thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> I've lost 35 pounds, by the way, in the last four years. Yes. Oh, did I say that out loud? I didn't even know. Um, actually, nobody knows my SAT score except my wife, Debbie, which we will never reveal uh, to this day. Um, even waterboarding will not get it out of me, and I won't. But it only gets better for Adam. He has been recognized as the single highest rated professor in the Wharton MBA program, where he is a tenured professor, one of Business Week's favorite professors, and one of the world's top 40 business professors under 40. Just the fact that you're under 40 <laughs> is annoying in itself. <laughs> Ditto. Adam speaking and uh, consulting clients include, oh, Google, Apple, uh, Microsoft, the UN, <laughs> the US Department of State, Facebook, JP Morgan, the Royal Bank of Scotland, and several branches of our armed services. And like Jeff, Adam has found ways to use his profession to give back to the community. He's designed several experimental learning activities based on The Apprentice in which students have raised over $175,000 for the Make-A-Wish Foundation while developing leadership, networking, and collaboration <laughs> skills. I don't know what you're doing at the UM, but it ain't working. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently you have some work left to do, Adam Grant. <laughs> Not like me. <laughs> Adam's research focuses on work, motivation, pro-social giving and helping behaviors, job design and meaningful work, leadership and burnout. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be joined by Sherry and the two daughters in just a couple minutes. Based on what we've already, it wasn't that funny, Jordan. Based on what we've already told you, it should come as no surprise that Adam has been the recipient of numerous awards representing the fields of education, industry, management, science, and psychology. He is the author of Give and Take, A Revolutionary Approach to Success, a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling book that is being translated into more than two dozen languages. And what could only be described as beshared, and this really is amazing, he has a passion and does professionally perform magic. Didn't know that, and it's the truth, I mean, because Jeff loved magic. I have a picture of Jeff performing at our kid's birthday party. They both have a love for magic. It really is a marriage tonight of, of two great men, and I, it, to me, that just blew me away. So I say Bashir uh, because anyone uh, who knew Jeff knew how much he had a passion for that and loved performing. So, uh, Mike? It's only fitting that Adam is part of the first annual Jeffrey Zaslow Media Night, that he is helping to continue the magic that is Jeff. Ladies and gentlemen, Please give a warm welcome to Adam Grant. Well, eight and a half years ago, I never would have imagined standing here. It was the last time I was at Tamashaner. It was when my wife and Al Allison and I got married. And many of you were here. It was the moment I reconnected with Jeff. We grew up across the street from his family. When I went off to college, we had sort of fallen out of contact. And when Jeff and Sherry came to the wedding, it was a wonderful chance to reconnect. And <laughs> Jeff really stepped up in a mentoring role, thank you, in my life at that point. I think we're here tonight to celebrate a really extraordinary life, a life that ended too early, but lives on in all of our hearts. Jeff, although he wrote about the last lecture and brought it to millions of people, never had the chance to give his last, last lecture. And in preparing for tonight, I began to wonder, what would Jeff have said if he were standing on stage for the last time? I don't know what words he would have chosen, 
but I do know how he would have made you feel. He would have dazzled you with humor, enlightened you with wisdom, and inspired you to think about how you could live a more meaningful and purposeful life. Now that's a tall order for tonight. I want to try to do something slightly more modest. I just want to capture a tiny sliver of what made Jeff such a special person and what I've learned from him in the past few years and over the course of the past few decades as well. And I want to do it as Jeff would have done with just a pinch of entertainment and a dash of insight. The last conversation I ever had with Jeff was in preparing for my book tour. I asked him, how do you speak to crowds of thousands of people? And he said, well, it's very simple. I just make them laugh. And I said, how do you know that they'll laugh? He said, I don't. That's why I bring funny video clips. <laughs> Which, in homage to Jeff, I have done tonight. And Al, in a moment, you will get your payback with one of those video clips. <laughs> now, I'll never forget the day that I met Jeff. Um, roughly, it was 22 years, five months, and three days ago, <laughs> give or take. I was 11, and he had moved in with his family right across the street, although as corrected tonight, apparently it was really diagonal. I think that still counts as across the street, <laughs> don't you? And we were at a neighborhood barbecue, and this guy with very sort of scraggly, curly hair came over. He was supposed to be interacting with the grown-ups, but instead he came to shoot baskets with me. And you've got a picture of me being about a foot and a half shorter and even nerdier than I look right now. <laughs> and Jeff introduced himself and immediately challenged me to a game of horse. And I'm thinking, how in the world am I going to win this game? And then Jeff proceeds to shoot about 17 air balls in a row. <laughs> and I think, I've got this. Well, we're neck and neck. We each get an H, and then an O, and then an R, and then an S. And all of a sudden, he loses the ability to shoot. I'm not sure why at the time. Later, I began to believe that Jeff really wanted me to win. I now know he was just a terrible athlete. <laughs> <laughs> but what was interesting was the reason Jeff lost they came a horse was he spent most of the time asking me questions about who I was, what I valued, what I was studying in school, what I was passionate about. And it was the first time I ever remember having a conversation with an adult outside of my family who actually treated me like another adult. And as a very shy, slightly socially awkward kid, it was a great moment to start thinking about coming out of my shell. And even though we had just met, I had this uncanny sense that, that this guy who had just met me really cared about me. Plus, I had kicked his ass in horse. And for me, that was really the first of many signs that Jeff was what I've come to call a giver. I think we heard it from Mike already, that Jeff was the most selfless person I've ever met. In technical terms, now that I'm in academia and gathered a couple of letters known as PH and D, I can tell you that we actually would describe him as a minch. And it was amazing to me all the different ways that he would help others without asking for anything back. I was able to dig up a letter that he wrote to his Orlando roommates circa 1983, right after he moved to Chicago, when he actually gave the croissant out of his mouth to a homeless person, and then sought out that person several days, bringing food from the hotel that he was staying at at the time to make sure that this guy was fed. And then other people who gathered in the area started to catch on, and pretty soon there was a mid-50s Afri African-American woman with a mustache asking him for money. And Jeff gave her every single coin he had in his pocket. And you know we can all think of these moments. Um, the Zaz Bash came up a moment ago. And I'd just like to set the record straight here and say that when Jeff was, was told, gee, 78 marriages, that's pretty great, he was very quick to point out, well, you know that led to 79 divorces. <laughs> because there was one couple that hated each other so much, they wanted to get married just so they could divorce again. <laughs> and I think that kind of humility was, was just par for the course with him. You see it in his books, that despite the fact that he had lived such an interesting and meaningful life, he never wrote about himself. He was always shining the spotlight on other people and trying to bring them out of the shadows to get the, the credit that they deserve. And I think it's one of the greatest tragedies of this century that Jeff isn't here with us today to know this impact that he's had on all of our lives. And sometimes it was the smallest things, like the time that he ran into my dad at Costco and wanted to make sure that my dad had a copy of his book, the latest one. So Jeff went and bought a copy of his own book. 
paying out of his own pocket so he could sign the copyright in the store for my father. <laughs> that was the kind of man that Jeff Zaslow was. And I have to say, you can only observe this behavior so much before you begin to wonder, what is wrong with this man? <laughs> Does he not understand how the rest of us live our lives? And the more I observed Jeff, the more I began to wonder, is this really a good way to live your life? Is it a good idea to be a giver, to be selfless, to put other people ahead of yourself? I decided actually to write a book about that question. And the first conversation I ever had about it was with Jeff. I called him up and asked him about it, and he gave me a bunch of ideas. And the first thing he said was, well, if you're not a giver, you got to be something else. What are you if not a giver? And I said, a jackass. <laughs> he said, I don't think people are going to want to read about that and identify with that category. So I'd suggest a slightly different label. And I came to call these other two groups of people takers and matchers. Takers are the people who always try to get stuff from other people. They never want to give anything back unless they have to. You know them. You may even be married to one. I've actually spotted two of those marriages tonight. <laughs> I won't say who you are, but soon you will know. The takers are the people who specialize in things like social loafing and free riding and are always trying to make sure that they get the best from others and give nothing back. And if you're ever surrounded by even a couple takers, pretty soon you will start to be paranoid, worrying that others are out to get you. And I just wanted to bring that to life tonight, so I'd like you to just look around the room. I know a lot of people know each other well. And I'd like you to identify the most paranoid person here. <laughs> and in a moment, I'm going to ask you to point to that person. <laughs> now, I'm not really going to ask you to do that. But the way you would know if they're that person is was your first thought, oh my god, they're all going to point at me. <laughs> Where is the nearest exit? Well, I think Jeff actually made it possible for us to experience the opposite of paranoia. There's a term for it. It's called pronoia, which is known as the delusional belief that other people are plotting your well-being. <laughs> this irrepressible fear that other people are going around behind your back and saying exceptionally nice things about you. How dare they? Well, when you interacted with Jeff, you always had this fear that he was not out to get you, he was out to help you. And no matter how hard you tried to stop him, he was going to find a way to make sure that you got exactly the help you deserved from him. And it's interesting because Jeff encountered his share of takers in his life, but he didn't allow them to undermine his optimism or his faith in humanity. He didn't do what most people do in response to takers, which is to become this third group of people known as matchers. Matchers are people who try to keep an even balance of give and take, quid pro quo. I'll do something for you if you do something for me. And a lot of people choose that as a way to play it safe and make sure they don't get exploited by the takers in their midst. But interestingly, Jeff didn't go that way. He continued giving. And I was trying to find an image that would really capture Jeff's giving here. And I thought, <laughs> this is a clear symbol of Jeff as a giver. He's also a taker in this picture, if you count the number of painkillers this event required. <laughs> but I wanted to give you all a chance to think about how you could be more like Jeff tonight. I wanted to ask you, are you primarily a giver, a taker, or a matcher? When you interact with other people, do you help them without strings attached? Do you look for something in return? Or do you try to come out ahead? And look, I'm a psychologist. I love tests. So I wanted to prepare a small test for you all to take. Whenever you're ready, let's take a look. Let's try that again. Let's take a look. There we go. Now, I have a, a sneaking feeling that what Jeff would have said at this moment is that the longer it took you to laugh at this cartoon, the more likely it is that you are a taker. <laughs> and I got to wondering, you know, if we look at Jeff's career, he had lots of ups and downs. Was it really a good idea to be a giver? Would he have been better off as a taker or a matcher? And I actually went to look at some data. So there were data on engineers. And in engineering, we want to know what happens to your productivity. 
based on doing favors for others versus getting favors back. There were medical students. <laughs> what happens to your grades in medical school is a function of how much you like helping others. And my personal favorite, salespeople. <laughs> what happens to your sales revenue based on how much you support your colleagues and your customers? Well, it turns out there's one group among the givers, the takers, and the matchers who consistently underperforms. And it is actually the givers. And this made me worried about following Jeff's example. In engineering, the least productive people are the ones who do more favors than they get back. They're so busy doing other people's jobs, they run out of time and energy to get their own work done. In medicine, the lowest grades belong to the students who agree most strongly with statements like, I love helping others, which suggests the doctor you ought to trust today is the one who came to medical school with no desire to help anybody. And then in sales, the lowest revenue accrues to the people who work the hardest to help others. Now, I used to work in sales, and I found this a little puzzling. So I found a guy who had an extraordinarily high giver score and, let's say, the least revenue in the history of his company. And I asked him, how do you explain this? Why do you suck at your job? I didn't ask it that way. <laughs> but what is the cost of generosity for you? And he said, well, can I be honest with you? And I said, no, as a researcher, I want you to lie to me. <laughs> Yes, please be honest. And he said, well, if I could be 100% candid, I care so deeply about my customers that I would never sell them one of our crappy products. <laughs> and I think this is really sad news for givers. And I think that we can all recall moments when we worried that Jeff was overextending himself, that he was going too far to support other people and not securing his oxygen mask before assisting others. And as I thought about this, I was reminded of one of the great philosophers of our time, who actually introduced this idea of givers and takers around the time that I was marveling at Jeff's stance. And I wanted to roll a quick video clip on this because I think it captures how many of us look at the givers in our lives. And it will also give you a close look at exactly who Big Al resembles. <laughs> yeah, since college. Hey, Lena Small's on this list. Lena Small? Yeah. The girl I was going to call for a date, she was unlisted, and now here's her number. Oh, you're not going to cop a girl's phone number off an AIDS charity list. Lane, you should admire me. I'm aspiring to date a giving person. <laughs> but you're a taking person. That's why I should date a giving person. If I date a taking person, everyone's taking, taking, taking. No one's giving. It's bedlam. Guess what? Lena found out how I got her number. Really? How'd she do that? Uh, a friend of a friend of Susan's. My Susan? Why'd you tell her? <laughs> I had to, Jerry. It's a couple rule. We have to tell each other everything. Well, you know what this means, don't you? What? You're cut off. You're out of the loop. <laughs> you cut, you're cutting me off? No, no, no. Jerry, don't cut me off. You leave me no choice. You're the media now, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> Jerry, come on, please, it won't happen again. If you were in the mafia, would you tell her every time you killed someone? Hey, a hit is a totally different story. I don't know, George. So Lena was upset, huh? You know what? That was the amazing thing. What, it didn't bother her? No, she said it was fine. Something very strange about this girl. What? She's too good. Too good. I mean, she's giving and caring and genuinely concerned about the welfare of others. I can't be with someone like that. I see what you mean. I... It's funny because it's true, right? We've all looked at givers in our lives, maybe even occasionally Jeff, and said, oh, what a do-gooder, a bleeding heart. It's a sign of weakness, which led me to wonder who rises to the top if givers are the ones who burn out and sacrifice themselves? Is it the takers or the matchers who perform the best? I wanted to go get a quick vote. How many think the takers are typically the most successful? Raise your hands, please. How many think the matchers are the most successful? And how many of you didn't raise your hands? <laughs> Thank you so much for your participation tonight. You would have just failed my class. <laughs> now, let me start with some good news that would have pleased Jeff. The takers do not rise to the top. They tend to succeed quickly, but also fail 
quickly, and they fail at the hands of matchers. If you are a matcher, you believe in an eye for an eye, a just world, what goes around comes around. And when it doesn't, you know it's time to step up and become what you might call the karma police. There is nothing a matcher hates more than seeing a taker act selfishly and get away with it. That's just not fair. And so if you are a true matcher and you meet a taker, you just feel like it's your mission in life to punish the hell out of that person. <laughs> and that way justice is served. Well, Jeff actually took great joy, I think, in punishing takers and seeing them get a little bit of a taste of their own medicine. Right? Even if it was something as simple as dangling a dollar on an invisible string on vacation and watching these people who are so desperate to pick up a dollar make a fool of themselves chasing it around, <laughs> laughing hysterically from under a bridge. And I think that what's amazing about this is that this group of people that I've come to call matchers, these people who love fairness and justice, are actually plotting the demise of the selfish bastards among us. And I think we need more of these people. I think that one of the things you should also realize, though, that Jeff understood intuitively, is sometimes takers will fall by their own sword. Because there is a group of people who hates to see takers fail more than anything else. These are the people who want to make sure that takers always suffer. Who hates to see takers rise? Who is it? Other takers, yes. Think about it this way, if you follow professional baseball and you are a star player, you want to be the only one doping. <laughs> because that is how you maintain your advantage. You clear all the other dopers out of the system and then you can win. I think one of the things that Jeff understood that few of us do is that a lot of the times the takers would fall on their own sword, which leads to the logical conclusion that it must be the matchers who win the biggest in life, but they're not. The data show that the best results belong to the givers again, every single time. The best engineers, the best medical students, the best salespeople, and also the best human beings are the generous people among us. And I think this is something we can really see if we track Jeff's career. I think he understood something that Thomas Jefferson observed centuries ago, which is that if you light somebody else's candle, it doesn't darken yours. And Jeff was constantly looking for ways to light other people's candles. And there's some specific things that I've taken away from watching him do this that I think we can all emulate. I want to talk to you a little bit about how I've applied some of his advice and also what we can all do with it. The first thing that I saw Jeff do over and over again is kind of captured in the antithesis of this cartoon, which he drew over 30 years ago. It was a story of really what happened to Jeff when he arrived in Chicago and all of a sudden had to work in the business district. And he found people to be callous and cold and cutthroat. And he decided that he did not want to be one of those people. And he spent the rest of his life doing as many five-minute favors as possible. I got one email forwarded from a child who, at this point, was 24, but right around his bar mitzvah had written in response to a column that Jeff wrote that he found really touching. Jeff wrote him a full-page letter back in detail and apologized for taking an entire week to get back to him when he'd gotten over 500 fan emails. Now, I know that email only took Jeff five minutes, but it was something that stuck with this kid for the next decade that led him to feel like somebody out there valued him, noticed him, and appreciated him. And I think one of the most amazing things about Jeff, if you look at those kinds of behaviors, is he was never too important for somebody else, no matter who they were, no matter who they stood in the world. And I think that that's something we could probably all do more of, right? A few more five-minute favors every day and every week, following in his footsteps. Now, I was a beneficiary of one of these five-minute favors. When I called Jeff to talk about this idea I had for a book, he said, I like the topic of writing about generosity, but I don't feel like you have a good hook there. And what Jeff understood is that giving to other people, helping other people, is not the same as being nice to them. He could have easily taken that call with me and said, great idea, good luck, and just been a cheerleader. And instead, he gave me some tough love, which really prompted me to reflect on what's the best way to present this set of ideas. Now, I think when Jeff did that, some people found it a little bit challenging to interpret, right? Here's this guy that's incredibly compassionate, and now he's being a little bit hard on you. Where's that coming from? 
I would say that a lot of us confuse generosity with niceness, and we shouldn't, right? Sometimes the best thing you can do to help other people is to give them the critical feedback that they did not want to hear, but that they needed to hear. And this is especially hard for some of you if you come from one country that confuses nice with generosity more than any other because it's the nicest country on the planet. Anyone know what that is? It's not the United States. Think a little bit brisker and further north. <laughs> Canada. In the 1970s, there was a Toronto radio station that said, we need more Canadian pride. We want to have a national slogan, like, as American as apple pie. So they invite Canadians to fill in the blank as Canadian as dot, dot, dot. Now I'm thinking the winning entry is going to be as Canadian as ice hockey or as Canadian as maple syrup. But no, four million Canadians voted for the best demonstration of Canadian nice that you will ever find. They voted for the national slogan, I kid you not, as Canadian as possible under the circumstances. Now, if you're really nice or truly Canadian, <laughs> you understand that right away, right? How could I ever say I'm any one thing? I'm constantly adapting to please other people. And I would say pleasing other people is not the same as helping them. Jeff was always looking out for our long-term best interests, not what would make us just feel good in the moment. And that conversation I had with him really prompted me to step back and think about what would be the best way to pitch these ideas? He said, you've got to surprise people. You've got to be counterintuitive. It's not enough to just say that givers win. You've got to also show that they lose and articulate the difference between the two. And I think he knew that from his own experience. Now, a third thing that I learned from Jeff <laughs> is captured by this cartoon. Jeff was constantly testing people, right? He would put you in situations like this and then watch what you would do. And if you walked away with his chair, most people in Jeff's shoes would say, I'm done with you. But Jeff was always looking for the potential in other people. He saw more potential in others than they saw, in fact, in themselves. And in doing that, he, I think, inspired all of us to raise our aspirations, to aim higher than we thought possible. I felt this personally. When I was in the middle of writing my book, I called him for some advice. And Jeff, this time, decided I was onto something of value. And he said, I can't believe this. The little schnitzel from across the street is going to be famous. <laughs> I was like, little schnitzel? You never told me that. Thank you. But he then released The Magic Room, and he went off on book tour, and I can only imagine how busy he was. Right? He was constantly dealing with press. He was traveling all over, and he took the time out of that tour to reach out a week later and ask me how it was going. And the thoughtfulness, the thoughtfulness there just really caught me by surprise. I talked to him a couple months later and told him I was getting ready to meet with publishers and starting to think about pitching this book idea to them. And Jeff said, I think you're going to do great. Here's to hoping that you're the next Malcolm Gladwell. Now, I don't know what Jeff was thinking when he said that. <laughs> because, let's face it, I don't have an afro. I did realize at some point, though, that he probably was thinking back to the days when he met me. And there is a lot of similarity between an afro and a Jufro. I'm sad to say that I did not become the next Malcolm Gladwell. And in that, I think I probably fell short of Jeff's expectations. But the fact that he set the bar that high did motivate me to do things that I never would have considered. And I want to come back to that in just a second. Before I do that, <laughs> Jeff selected himself into a business where he had to self-promote. Right? An author lives by the ability to get ideas out into the world. So how does somebody who's generous and humble self-promote? Well, he does it in his own clever way. Many of you know the story of when he was interviewing for this position to replace a famous advice columnist. And 
he was asked, you know, you're only 28 years old. What do you know? What could you possibly teach other people who are writing in for advice? And Jeff said, well, I may be only 28, but I have the wisdom of a 29-year-old. <laughs> and I thought about that in one of the most challenging situations that I faced professionally. At 25 years old, I was asked to stand in front of a group of one-star and two-star generals in the United States Air Force. On average, they were twice my age. They had flown typically 3,000 miles per person. Uh, some managed multi-billion dollar budgets. They'd done bombings in multiple countries. And they had really, really cool nicknames like Striker and Gunner and Iceman. <laughs> and I was supposed to come in and teach these people twice my age something about leadership. And I walked in and I tried to, I tried to enlighten them a little bit. And then I read the feedback forums. And the representative comment that stuck with me to this day was there was more knowledge and experience in the audience than on the podium. <laughs> Followed by such gems as, you might want to quit your day job and go back to magic. <laughs> and I was like, yes, I will. Thank you very much. <laughs> there were also a few people who pointed their guns at me during the session, which was not a good feeling. But I was thinking about this. And I think just as we heard earlier from Mike and Al, the what would Jeff do question stuck with me. And I started thinking about how would Jeff walk into a situation like this, right? What, it, what is the line that he would bring in? And Jeff was always willing to call out the elephant in the room, right? He would point out the uncomfortable thing that nobody else was willing to speak. And so I decided I had signed up for one more of these sessions before they were going to fire me. And I walked in and I said, okay, we're going to do this the Zaz way. And my very opening line was, okay, I understand that we're going to be here for four hours together. And I know what you all are thinking right now. What can I possibly learn from a professor who's 12 years old? <laughs> and one of the guys shot back, no, come on, you've got to be at least 13. <laughs> I delivered the exact same material, but by acknowledging the position uh, that I was in, I think I was able to form a much more authentic connection with these guys. And the feedback forums looked quite different. They included statements such as, wow, for a 13-year-old, Adam doesn't have very much hair. And it went much better. And I've tried to keep that lesson with me ever since that happened, about speaking modestly, about being humble. And I had a great opportunity to try to put that to test a few months ago. I was asked to create a video trailer for my book. And again, the question was, what would Jeff do? I don't want to go and tell people how great my ideas are. I don't want to feel like I'm self-promoting. So what's the self-deprecating way to do this? And I want to show you what we ended up coming up with. And this is the video that I hope Jeff would have wanted me to create instead of the one that I was asked to create. I believe wholeheartedly in the power of giving and generosity. And the highest form of giving is allowing your name to be used for a website. I was a total giver. Uh, I, I made it possible for my team to go to the Super Bowl. If they'd have been better players, we'd have won those Super Bowls. I found Adam Grant's book, Give and Take, so amazing that it's inspired me to give away 10,000 copies of my own book, David and Goliath. Wait, we're not really doing that, are we? My daughters are so lucky that I spend so much time helping them be the best that they can be. I mean, I spent four hours editing the Mother's Day card that Lulu made me. When it comes to helping my children, there's just nothing I won't do. Adam's book, Give and Take, is like a fundamental outline as to how to be successful. Can, can you at least get me a copy of the book so I know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I think that's the, the legacy that, that Jeff really left for us, right? To say that although generosity and compassion is an extremely serious topic, that it's the very, at the very center of how we think about morality and ethics, we can also live it and do it in a lighthearted way that makes people laugh as much as it makes them feel. 
A friend said recently that when you think about iconic figures in the wor world's history, like Steve Jobs, oftentimes they are great men, but not good men. And I think the thing that I admire most about Jeff is that he was both the greatest of great men, but also the goodest of good men. Now, I realize my mother, the English teacher, will tell me that goodest is not a word <laughs> after this session, and I say, so what? <laughs> now, one of the things that I didn't expect to happen in the past year and a half after dedicating my book to Jeff is that people who knew him would come out of the woodwork and reach out with their stories. And that's been, I think, the single best part of writing this book for me, is to find out, in fact, that not only were millions of strangers touched by his work, but that people I knew knew Jeff and had had their lives changed by him without us even realizing that we both had that connection. I've had emails from literally dozens of writers who said, Jeff read my book proposal. He gave me feedback. He helped me open the door to get my book published. And he did all of this quietly behind the scenes, never asking for anything, not even a thank you note or a word of gratitude. But the, I think the most moving of all was a note that came from Brad Epstein. Brad was an executive in healthcare, and he and I had actually worked together about six years ago on a project. And Brad reached out, he had looked at the opening page of my book and stopped in his tracks and said, Jeff Zaslow. Did you know him? And he sends me this email. And I said, no, there are a lot of Jeff Zaslow's in the world. It must be a different guy. <laughs> How did you know him? And Brad said, well, well, Jeff was actually my roommate after college. We lived together in our mid-20s. And I had no idea that they knew each other. And Brad, I think like all of us, was as devastated by our loss as he was inspired by every interaction that he had with Jeff. And I think Brad really summed up the impact that Jeff has had on all of us uh, with a really beautiful statement that has stuck with me. There is not a day that I don't go by thinking about it and thinking about how I can live that way more. Brad said, I miss the light that Jeff added to the world, yet I can see the glow from countless candles that he lit. And I think that's what this room and this evening represents. We are all candles lit by Jeff Zaslow. We are all also candles lit by Sherry and Jordan and Alex and Eden who are carrying forward his legacy. And I think the single best thing we can all do to show other people in the world what it's like to have known Jeff Zaslow is to try to light other people's candles in his memory and in his honor. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> In a word, wow. How many of you are now thinking twice about taking a cookie home from the sweet table? <laughs> Am I right or wrong? Adam is graciously, I, I, I'm, I, it's breathtaking. I, this is a shining example of a younger generation that will be impacted, already has been impacted, and will for years to come. I, could you ask for anything that would be more representative of Jeff Zaslow than Adam Grant? Wow. So as difficult as it is for almost 400 people to stay away from dessert being Jewish, and I know some people are shaking, uh, Adam has graciously agreed to take a couple questions. But before he takes a couple of questions, we said to Adam, Adam, we would be very happy to give you an honorarium. He said, absolutely not. Let, let us pay for your, your, your plane ride here. Where did he come from? Buffalo, New York. <laughs> and, the, and the family, uh, the, the uh, Fleischman Endowment, who brings lectures and education to the Jewish senior life. Marvin and Sharon, would you stand? Thank you so very much for sponsoring. <laughs> His trip here. We appreciate I know they don't like this, but I had to give it to you. There you go. Mike and I reduced our fee for this evening. <laughs>
complete. We flew in from Farmington Road. We did. <laughs> Rough landing, but complete transparency here. I, I want to add one thing because I'm always. I will lay in bed tonight, and I know I'll go. Oh my God, I forgot. But I really wanted to thank Carol and the entire committee, as I know Mike does, for having us be part of this because there's a lot of people that could have stood up here and talked the same way and represented the same way for Jeff Sazza. You're right. But the. Um, <laughs> But I want to thank uh, everybody, the friends of Jewish Senior Life. What a, for, for an out-of-the-box first-time annual event, holy cow. Wow, thank you, Carol, and everybody. And to Leslie and everybody down the line. So I guess you're going to take, we have a, if you have time, if you want, a couple questions. If uh, we do have a moment or two for a quick question, we'll have a microphone going around. So um, I, I, there we go. We, I can walk over here with a mic. All right, go ahead. Is this from Adam's father? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, my question is uh, if giving helps people, or helps drive people's success, and I think most people probably feel good when they give. I know I feel good when I give. How come everybody doesn't do it? How come we're all not givers? Yeah, why aren't we all givers? I think a lot of us get scared away, to be honest. Right? We, we see what happens when occasionally somebody makes the mistake of trusting a taker, and we know that that's dangerous. Um, typically, the negative impact of a taker is, is double or triple the positive impact of a giver when it comes to role models. So we learn maybe three times as much about how dangerous it is to, it, it is to give from takers as we do learn from positive examples of givers. Think about it this way. One bad apple can spoil a barrel, but one good egg does not make a dozen. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> I thought you were quoting Donny Osmond there for a second. <laughs> um, <laughs> look, I think, I think a lot of people live in fear, right? They're, they're afraid of the risks. And I, I think it's actually much more terrifying to think about what are the costs of not being a giver and not making use of our time in ways that allows us to lift other people up. So. Next victim, please. Over here. for coming tonight, and I wanted to know, how old were you when you decided you were going to write a book? I was in the womb. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, I think, I, I started thinking about it when I was in college. Um, I actually, I remembered reading uh, a number of books. Uh, there were actually a couple of Jeffs that I started reading, uh, but the moment that I first started thinking about writing a book was when I read the last lecture and said that the, the, the biggest thing that you could do as, as a writer, an idea person, a professor for that matter, is get your ideas out to a broader audience. And I was just so inspired by the reach of that lecture. I literally had over 100 people send it to me in the first hour that it was live, saying this seems like what you study and what you want to understand. And it was all I could do to write back and say, I know that was my neighbor! <laughs> um, fangirl moments aside, uh, I think that was the crystallizing moment. And uh, it was probably not until I reached out to Jeff to talk about it, and he said, yes, you should do this. Yes, you should go out there and try to share your ideas that I decided it was worth a shot. Anyone else? You're welcome. Adam Grant, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Adam. I, I also... Um, you know, personally, Sherry and, and the girl, uh, Eden, Alex, and Jordan, thank you for letting us share your family so intimately the way we have tonight and over these last few weeks. And uh, just to remind you, because I, I couldn't get over it, when I found it on YouTube by myself at one in the morning, I found Jordan singing that Bruce Springsteen song, which was recorded bef well before Jeff passed away. This was not recorded in memory or in honor of Jeff. It was recorded because Jeff was a huge Springsteen fan and she recorded it way before this ever happened. And that's what makes it so special and it was one of Jeff's favorites, of course, as, as it is the whole family. That was, that was amazing. Wasn't I, didn't, it? He, I never knew you could sing. Yeah. We're told that you can do comedy. She is an aspiring stand-up comic and she's a natural. Is she doing comedy? <laughs> no. <I> <laughs> right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Jeff's beautiful wife, Sherry. And their three incredible daughters, Jordan, Alex, and Eden.
<laughs> I just am overwhelmed. I just wanted to stand here for a moment and just look out and see all these beautiful, wonderful faces of our friends and family and the people who mean so much to us. And can't tell you how much it means to have you all here, to remember Jeff in this very, very beautiful way. Um, I want to thank everybody for this incredible tribute. This was, I couldn't imagine anything more beautiful. Um, it truly is a special and magical evening, which was what we wanted to present, and you sure did. And we are very touched and very moved by what you've created. Um, on behalf of Jeff's family, his sister Lisa and her husband David are there. And there stand, up. stand up, stand up. Lisa, her husband David, <laughs> Jeff's brother Daryl, and his wife Sherry. Um, my daughter is Jordan. Jordan, <laughs> Alex, Eden, you're supposed to be an age order here. And uh, all of the members of our family who couldn't be here tonight, including my brother and his wife who are in Buffalo. How did you get out? Because <laughs> they couldn't get out. Um, we'd like to thank everybody involved from Friends of Jewish Senior Life. I, I, I don't know how to begin to thank you for this beautiful, beautiful tribute. Uh, the whole planning committee for your months of work. I, just amazing when we first sat down that first and I had nothing to do with it but I was there for the first meeting and never dreamed that it would be anything so spectacular um, you've done a really really wonderful job of portraying the different parts of Jeff's life his uh, personal life and his professional life all linked together by one thing and that's the importance of love it was Jeff's message in his books and his columns and of course in the way he lived his life Everyone who knew him um, was lucky to be embraced by that love. I think we can all agree with that. And of course, we, his family, were the luckiest of all. I want to thank Adam Grant, little, the little schnitzel. schnitzel. That was it. I was going to say pizzola, but it's a little schnitzel. And he, did, he always called it a little schnitzel. <laughs> for taking the time to join us tonight. Jeff would be so proud of you, Adam. Oh my gosh, so proud of all you've accomplished and so proud of the important message uh, in your book, Give and Take, and all the books to come. Uh, he's so proud and you make us all very proud. Alan and Stoney, wow, thank you so much for your friendship and for everything you've done uh, to make this evening so special. That video is amazing, and, and, and your friendship with Jeff through the years. He loved you both very much, you know that. Um, Jeff told the stories of some of the most inspirational people of our time, and he never realized that he himself was really one of the most inspirational of all. Um, I think we knew it. I don't think he ever realized it. But it's wonderful to know that people continue to be inspired by his words and by the kind of person that he was. Jeff would be so happy to see all of you here. He'd be cracking jokes about people, and uh, he'd be doing shtick. Uh, maybe he'd do a little magic. He'd be wearing his Hawaiian shirt, you know? Uh, he'd be maybe doing some magic with Adam, but uh, actually he was pretty magical just being Jeff. He was filled with love, always, and I know that he would want me to express how much he loved all of you, I know he would be so honored and so touched by this tribute tonight, and I, I can't tell you what it means to us. Um, we are very grateful to all of you. We are grateful for your friendship and for your love, and it's, that is something that we will always cherish, and uh, we want to thank you so, so very much. Thank you. Uh, Sherry and girls. Does Sherry have to work tonight? No. Yeah, she has to be there by 11. <laughs> She's doing Let It Rip with Huell. Uh, Murray Feldman is going back. And he's oh, Murray Feldman's going back to cover doing the news. There's a fire at an abandoned house, Murray. Get on it. <clears throat> There's a shock. Just run file footage. Uh, look. Uh, Sherry had one request, really, from the very beginning of this process, and that was... I wasn't going to cry, but I'm about to, is that you leave here feeling the way Jeff would have made you feel. And I think between Adam and what you witnessed tonight, 
it's, it's a done deal. So this is a, a crystal book that has been designed for you and the family to take home. And then every year that we have a guest speaker, Adam will be back next year. <laughs> their I names, I, you can't, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, we'll be, their names will be placed on this plaque, but this is for you and the girls to display at home. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. She said, thank you so much, in Spanish. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for making this night an overwhelming success. Thanks again to the Jewish Senior Life for their incredible support from start to finish for making this night a reality. Thank you to everyone for being a part of the continuing honor to, ma to honor the magic that is Jeffrey Zaslow. We invite you now to join us for the Afterglow, and we hope to see you next year. Drive safely. God bless. My mother said, what in the world are you going to do with a creative writing degree? That's what she said to me. What are you going to do with that? And I said there, I said, well, I'm going to write, I'm going to be creative, I'm going to get a job, but I didn't really, didn't really know. And then I went and lived in her basement for 30 years. No, I didn't do that. But it all worked out really well. It's going to work out well. Some of you might be wondering, what are you going to do with your lives? It's all going to work out well. You're the smartest and the best, and it's going to work out, it's going to work out great. I feel like my, my experience as an advice columnist was helpful as I went about writing uh, writing that book with Randy. I once got a letter from a guy who said uh, it's Passover, he's feeling very constipated eating all that matzah, said do I have any advice? These are the questions I would get. So I thought a good product would be fiber matzah and the slogan could be let my people go. Either that or you could take Exodus Lax or Matzah Musil too, you know. People ask me, they say what do, you, what do your books have in common? And I think they're all about love, a love of uh, a family, a love of friends, a love of a sense of duty, and a love of life. And so uh, have a good rest of the day, and when you get home tonight, hug the people you care about. I'll, I'll be in the lobby, and I'll sign your book if you'd like, but thank you for waking up this morning and seeing me. Thank you very much. I realized from being in that store, my job as a father is not to tell my daughters what dress to wear, not to tell them what to do. My job is to tell my girls I love them. And yeah. Sherry, that I love her too, obviously. Yeah. Jordan and Alex Sazlo saying, 